yeah, I've been you know learning about climate change for quite a while. Uh, but in 2019, what I saw was amazing to me, which is that the interest in solving the problem, particularly by young people and not just one party or the other, the interest level is very, very high. And uh, I was considering publishing the book in 2020, but then as the pandemic was developing, uh, the work of the Gates Foundation uh, on the vaccines and other tools meant that that wasn't going to be a good year. The world appropriately wanted to see uh, the pandemic as the top priority. But, you know, there's three ingredients to solve climate. One is you have to have the right goal. And uh, I'm impressed everyone's picked uh, this goal of zero by 2050. You have to have the interest level because, you know, we need voters to drive policies because uh, government uh, plays such a central role. But then finally, you need a plan. And uh, I thought, you know, based on my experience at Microsoft and the foundation, thinking about innovation, which is harder in the climate space than any space I've ever worked in. You know, it's more capital, uh, just the physical scale is kind of mind blowing. I thought, hey, helping uh, to put a plan together and describe some of the work I'm doing uh, to contribute to that plan, it would be very timely as we come out of the pandemic and we have uh, Europe spending recovery money, uh, the US looking at lots of recovery money. How do we make sure that we go full speed on uh, solving climate and really make sure people understand it's not going to be easy. It's going to be actually very, very hard, but also make it clear that it's not impossible. It really is within reach. Well, you also write about in the book that it's important not to just go after what you term the, the low hanging fruit. And the low hanging fruit, I, I assume, is you know electric vehicles, uh, solar panels, things that are important. But uh, not when you look at the whole pie of all the things that contribute to the 51 billion uh, tons of, of CO2 in the atmosphere every year. Um, can, and in fact, what, can you just talk about what makes up, you know, all of the all of the uh, the emissions? Yeah, if there's one takeaway from the book uh, that I want to have uh, people remember, it's that we have lots of sources of emissions. Uh, in fact, I've got a slide that I think could help make this point. You know, it's it is uh, passenger cars because transportation, you know, is a big thing, uh, but that's only about seven percent. It is electricity generation uh, overall, uh, but that's about twenty seven percent. And you know, you have other things in transportation like planes, uh, but then you have this the three other sectors that people may not associate with uh, solving this problem. Uh, you've got agriculture, where you have uh, livestock and uh, fertilizer manufacture and uh, animal uh, manure handling, uh, and that's 19%. Uh, and you've got heating and cooling buildings, which we mostly use uh, natural gas for that, that's 7%. And then the biggest single sector is actually manufacturing uh, at 31%, and that's that's where you've got cement, uh, that's where you've got steel, those are the, the two biggest, uh, but it's pretty broad. You know, we make a lot of physical stuff, and if you look around, uh, you know, and you see uh, the plastic, the paper, the wallboard, the, you know, the cement and steel that makes the building uh, stand up, uh, you know, every physical thing, sadly, is associated with some level of emissions, and we have to rework uh, the way that we make those things. To me, to me, that is the most kind of eye-opening thing that that comes across in the book, and it's hard for me to still wrap my mind around it. Um, you, you know, you talk about the room you're sitting in. People who are watching right now, maybe they're at home, they're watching on a computer screen. The plastic that their computer is made out of, the uh, the wood that their desk is made out of, how it was cut, the machines probably use gas uh, for to, to run, the, uh, the cement in the building they live in, the steel the building is made out of. Every aspect of what you see needs to uh, 
have innovation needs to change the way we make it, right? That's right. Uh, you know, you, we the physical economy has gotten all these things to be so cheap that, you know, most people have never been to a cement plant or a steel plant. They, you know, the, the fact that uh, there were, you know, brilliant innovators that drove those things, uh, you know, and it's incredible. And, the, you know, the recipe for how we make those things is kind of fixed uh, because we know it's reliable and, and cheap. And so to, to be open-minded to say, no, we need to change those building codes. We need to, to build a market for something that at first, uh, you know, green steel costs a lot more than normal steel. Green cement costs almost three times uh, what normal cement costs. And so how do you get going? How do you get on that learning curve where you start to buy some and the more you make, you figure out just like happened with solar panels, that volume drove the price down as companies competed to uh, make it at lower price. When you don't have a market, that doesn't happen. And so bootstrapping across all those areas of emissions that we we drive the R&D, we drive the the innovators, but then as they come up with things, we have buying that that gets us on that scale up learning curve to get the price way, way down and get a green premium that's either very, very small or uh, near zero. That's the, the path to nirvana. I, I want to go over the course of this. I want to go into some of the details on things like cement because it's something, you know, I never really thought much about, but the, the scale of the problem it does seem at times insurmountable, but just can you just talk kind of broad, broad picture first? Guy, what what are you doing about climate change? Yeah, so the given the innovation agenda, there's policy things for all of it. You know, funding basic R and D and R and D budgets in these areas had had not gone up as we got to the 2015 uh, climate talks, uh, and so that kind of got on the agenda there, and it's. It's still, there's a lot that has to be done. Uh, so lots of things about policy, but there's kind of a pipeline for innovation. Uh, in fact, this is a, another one where I've got a slide uh, that I used to describe it that might be helpful. You know, way at the beginning, it's just basic R&D. It's like, you know, the National Institute of Health working on uh, biological things. Then we want to bring in uh, smart people and fund them even before they their ideas are, are uh, they can raise money on a private basis. So we have thing where we're bringing smart people together called fellows, uh, early stage. Then something can be venture funded. Uh, so that's Breakthrough Energy Ventures uh, that uh, we put together several funds and that's going super well. And then finally is this piece about buying the products, uh, which we call Catalyst. Uh, and that together with these market shaping policies you know, can get to where, at least for some of the categories, like passenger cars, over the next 10 to 15 years, as the range goes up, the charging stations are pervasive, the charge time, you know, goes down to be like filling a gas tank, you know, then you can get a zero green premium. But that one is the most mature of all the sectors. So we have to apply this pipeline across all those different areas of emissions. And I, you know, I'm, I'm working on advocacy, but specifically fellows, uh, the venture fund and catalyst uh, to accelerate that that pipeline. And you can see if, over time, well, I hope what that means is that green premium, uh, which is over five trillion a year right now, goes down by about 95 percent. I just want to break down this chart a little bit because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm confused by charts always. So it takes me a moment. But uh, for folks at home or who are watching, a Breakthrough Energy Ventures is a is a uh, an investment fund that you started about I think it was six years ago. You recruited a bunch of super wealthy people who everybody would know their names, and I think you raised a billion dollars. I think now there's a second billion dollars that you've raised, and you're looking for not just some quick way to make money. You are looking for people who are willing to invest long range because a lot of it, like hedge funds and stuff, they invest for five years and then they all want their money back and their huge returns. You're saying for real development, for real innovation, you need a 20 year investment maybe for in, in some things with no guarantee, frankly, that it's gonna work. Right, so the most mature part of this 
in terms of uh, what I'm doing is Breakthrough Energy Ventures. And it's exactly as you say, we are uh, just announced the second fund uh, and that's going well. We found lots of amazing companies uh, that if their work is successful, uh, can eliminate a half percent of the 51 billion tons of emissions. And so we need you know, companies in steel and cement and other things. Because that ventures piece has gone so well, and they've been able to work with other investors to raise that money. We're putting a thing at the earlier stage, fellows, where we just, you know, fund people at a quarter million a year to, to shape their ideas uh, coming out of big companies or academia. And then we're putting something that is after ventures, which is the catalyst buying piece. So those two pieces uh, I'm just putting together this year to complement the ventures piece because it's gone so well. And the, just so people know, the green premium that's on that chart, which starts out obviously higher on the left-hand side and then gradually gets smaller, just explain, green premium is the extra cost uh, making it carbon, uh, no, making it with zero carbon emissions, uh, adds on to the price of the development, the price of, of the actual product. And you want that green premium to go down, just like solar plant panels used to be far more expensive because more you know, innovation has taken place, more people are using them the price actually goes down and the quality actually goes up. That's what needs to happen in basically everything related to carbon emissions, all products, right? Exactly. So the green premium uh, is very different for different products. Uh, and uh, I promise you I only have this, uh, maybe my last slide, but I, I love slides. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, I love that you travel with slides. You bet. Uh, you know, PowerPoint, that's a... Uh, uh, my my favorite. So for passenger cars, where Tesla and others have done a brilliant job, and you even have people like GM saying as of 2035, they're only going to make electric cars. So that clearly shows that they think that the demand and the market will shift over. Today, you pay more up front uh, for an electric car, and you have to worry a little bit about the range and where you're going to do the charging. But as the batteries get better, uh, those prices go down, will go from what is a fairly small green premium today. I show on this slide, uh, I'm comparing a Chevrolet Malibu to a Chevrolet Bolt, which is the, an electric vehicle. And I, you know, I show about a 15% uh, green premium there. Uh, that's as of today, but I expect in the next 10 to 15 years, uh, actually the electric car would be preferable. So that's you know, amazing, eventually you won't have to have tax credits and zero emission requirements. On the other side of the slide, though, I show a, uh, a product that we haven't uh, made progress on, which is cement. And there you see that today's cement's $125 a ton. And yet, if you try and make it in a green way, uh, it basically doubles the price. Mm -hmm. And so that's one where we're not you know, we don't have a, a Tesla of cement. It's not clear, you know, where that will come from, uh, but we have to drive for that uh, because cement is responsible just by itself for 6% of all those emissions. So if you want to get to zero, you can't skip cement. And, and what, the thing that's fascinating to me about cement, which I never, is a sentence I never thought I would actually say, is that, which I read in your book, is that if you make a ton of cement, you release a ton of CO2. I mean, it's a it's a one to one ratio. Yeah, we, it's incredible that between heating up the limestone, uh, where you're generally burning a hydrocarbon like natural gas, and the chemical reaction where you're pulling that calcium out, it's actually CO2 that gets released. And so you have those two sources. And cement is very very cheap, and the number of cement plants in the world is you know, over 10,000. And so we're asking every one of those to put some new equipment in. Uh, there's a little bit of progress. There's a, you know, company, Carbon Cure, that, that cuts it by 10%. Uh, and company other... Breakthrough Energy Ventures has invested in, right? Exactly. Uh, so that's a start. Uh, but, wow, we have to get to 100%. And that, uh, it's not even clear how, how to go about that. But, you know, we have lots of people with, great ideas. And if we back them and give them policies, and even when the premium is still uh, non-zero, we create some demand for them to scale up. 
then we can get the same thing to happen there that happened with the electric electrified passenger car. 